Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Murphy's Law says, if anything can go wrong, it will. Most of us have probably experienced this law, such as if you wash your car on Saturday morning, it's going to rain on Saturday afternoon. If you take your troubled car to the mechanic, it will run perfectly once you're at the shop. If you change lanes in a grocery store, the one you were in will always move faster than the one you are in now. As soon as you find a product that you really like, they stop making it. After you've driven around the parking lot five times and you give in and park a long way from the store, the perfect parking spot opens up as you're walking in. When you read about the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, it seems like he experienced Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. During Paul's time at Philippi, something went wrong, but something of eternal good came out of it. In this portrait of grace, we'll take a look at the Philippian jailer. Acts 16, verses 16 to 18 read, And it came to pass, as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Verse 16 says, as we went to prayer. When Paul first came to Philippi, he met Lydia and other women who were gathered together for prayer on the Sabbath by a river outside of Philippi. He preached the gospel of grace to these women. A woman by the name of Lydia heard the gospel and believed, along with all of her household. She then invited Paul and his co-workers to stay in her home in Philippi. Verse 16 is speaking how, of how they were again going to the place of prayer down by the riverside. And as they went, they were met by a girl who was possessed by a demon. With the gospel of grace now being proclaimed in Europe, souls being saved, and the new work begun here in Philippi, Satan takes action in attempting to hinder the work. And Satan here uses a young woman who is under the control of one of his demons to fight against Paul's ministry. The phrase spirit of divination refers to a spirit of python. In Greek mythology, the python was the mythical serpent that guarded the oracle of Delphi the renowned temple of priestesses who supposedly uttered prophecy and were able to predict the future while they were under a trance. The Greek god Apollo then later supposedly slew this serpent at some point. But in Paul's day and in the Greek culture of Philippi, one who could foretell coming events was said to have the spirit of Python because of the priestesses at Delphi. Essentially, this girl was a medium in contact with demons that could supposedly predict the future. And it's funny how people don't change. People back then were as curious about the future as people are today. And the businesses of psychics and fortune-telling are profitable. And likewise, this fortune-telling girl gave her masters much gain as people flock to her for advice on politics, business, marriage, or whatever was troubling them. This young woman was under the control of a demon, and she was also under the control of a company of men who used her for, fi for financial gain. Apparently, she was too valuable of a slave for just one owner to afford, so she had masters, it says, plural. This slave girl followed Paul and his companions as they made their way to the river outside of Philippi, and she said, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. She attaches herself to Paul and his co-workers, shouted out who they were, 
servants of the Most High God, and shouts out what they were doing, which show unto us the way of salvation. She was right. But why she said it is another question. Seeing that she was demon-possessed, there's no doubt Satan was trying to compromise Paul's work. Demons then and now are actively involved in hindering God's work and God's people. They work to hinder the truth and keep people blind to the gospel. Likewise with Paul here, he silences this demon. The girl followed them that one day, and then she continued doing so, uh, following and taunting them for many days. Paul patiently endured her persistent ranting for a time, but finally one day he had his fill of it. He was grieved, it says, which means he was uh, troubled or greatly annoyed as she followed him saying this over and over again. Paul then turns around, faces her head on, and with one swift sentence which he directed to the demon, he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and the demon did. He spoke in the name of Christ and in his authority, and it left the girl. Acts 16, 19 to 24 read, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. When the demon left the young woman, it took with it the ability to tell fortunes and make money for her masters. The masters of the girl had no concern for her whatsoever. They were only interested in the money she provided for them. And now that their source of income was gone, needless to say, the masters were enraged. These greedy masters then seized Paul and, and Silas and drew them. Now, drew is too kind of a word in the way we understand it. Drew literally means they drug them to the marketplace before the civil magistrates. The masters of the woman who was delivered from the demon were just as much in Satan's power as the demon-possessed girl. They were pawns in his hand. Satan fails in his wily attempt to hinder the gospel, and now he tries a different approach where we see his true character. The marketplace that the masters drug them was the Agora, which was a large open-air public square in the middle of the city. There were vendors who sold their wares there. Public affairs were conducted in the marketplace as well. Since Philippi was a Roman colony, the magistrates that Paul and Silas stood before were most likely military officers in the Roman army. When the masters made their accusation against Paul and Silas, they don't tell the, the magistrates the truth. And the truth would have sounded something like, these men cast out a spirit from our slave girl, and now we got to work for a living. And that was the truth. Instead, these masters falsely charged them with exceedingly troubling our, and disturbing their city and propagating an unlawful religion. Hearing these accusations caused the spectators in the marketplace to get stirred up. A crowd had formed, and they were very much on the side of the accusers and in support of them. Moved by religious and racial prejudices, and also by the crowd violently rising up against Paul and Silas, the magistrates act rashly. They do not investigate the matter fully. The accused, Paul and Silas, are not even given an opportunity to dispute the charges. The magistrates instead stand up, tear off the clothes of Paul and Silas, and then command them to be beaten with rods. The ones that would beat them were lictors, 
Lictors were officers in the Roman army trained in the duty of scourging. They would have been summoned and would have bound Paul and Silas and then viciously beat their back raw with rods publicly in that marketplace for all to see. Now, flogging among the Jews was limited to 40 stripes save one, or 39 stripes. But these were Gentiles, and the Gentiles had no such law. And they laid many stripes, it says, on Paul and Silas. And the pain from this beating had to have been almost unbearable. But in it we visibly see now what the devil's reaction is to the gospel and souls being saved to persecute the messengers of the truth, to beat them, to imprison them. This is how the devil feels about it, and the kind of lengths he'll go to behind the scenes to work uh, towards silencing the church. It's been said well about Satan's methods in fighting the truth, that it is either by alliance or persecution. These are the alternatives. False friendship or open war? And in Acts 16, in this account, we see both of these methods used here through the demon-possessed girl and the beating of Paul and Silas. But in this account, it's not only the devil's response that we see, it's also the world's response of hatred and anger toward the gospel and the church. And that continues to this moment, too. Thus, because of the devil's and the world's opposition, as Paul later wrote the Philippians in the church here at Philippi later, he tells them, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians is a hardcover 400-page commentary written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www BereanBibleSociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.BereanBibleSociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. After a thorough beating, Paul and Silas were cast into prison by the lictors. The word cast shows that they were not led by the hand down the steps into the prison. They were thrown in, thrust into the prison. The jailer is given a charge by the lictors to keep them safely or securely. They were treated as though they were dangerous criminals. With these strict orders, coupled with the fact that the jailer's life depended on it, he takes no chances, and he moves them from where they were initially cast into prison to the inner prison, reserved for the worst of criminals. And when they got there, the jailer thrust them in, and so again, they're thrown into the prison. The inner prison would have been the most secure and the most miserable of places. They were usually below ground and damp, no light, reeking with filth, and alive with rats and bugs. Then the jailer takes another additional step to make them doubly secure, and he fastened their feet in stocks. Gareth Reese said this about the stocks. The two heavy pieces of timber would be opened. The legs of the prisoners were then stretched widely apart till, till their muscles began to hurt, and then the timbers would be clamped shut. Clamped in such a spread-legged position, they would be unable to walk or sit up, and they'd be forced to either lie with their backs or faces on the ground. Stripped of their clothes, faint 
weakened and sick from the pain, with lacerated bleeding backs, their feet encased in cruel stocks in that damp and rank and dark inner prison. And it makes all of us, and it makes me stop and think, could I do what Paul and Silas do next? Acts 16, 25 to 28 reads, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners have, had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Some equate suffering and hardship as indications of being out of God's will. But contrary to this kind of thinking, we find here that there are times when these things mean that you are, in fact, in the very center of God's will. Here, Paul and Silas were unjustly arrested, indicted, convicted, beaten, and imprisoned, but they refuse to let their circumstances determine their attitude or affect their faith in God. Evening comes on, and then at midnight, strange sounds are heard coming from their prison cell. And it's not the sound of angry and bitter cries of pain and self-pity. It's the sound of praying and singing. Paul and Silas were having a worship service in that inner prison. They do not question God for the injustice of it all or worry that he had forsaken them. They prayed to him and they praised him. Psalm 42, 8 says, The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. In Psalm 28, 7, David wrote, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. Andrew Murray stated this about God's purpose in our trials. First, he allowed this. It is by his will I am in this straight place. In that fact, I will rest. Next, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace to endure, enabling me to behave as his child. Then he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lessons he intends me to learn and working in me the grace he means to bestow. Last, in his good time, he can bring me out again how and when he knows. So let me say, I am here one, by God's appointment. Two, in his keeping. Three, under his training. Four, for his time. Paul and Silas knew this by faith as well. And in faith, they prayed. And they sang, and they sang with all of their heart to God. This was called, has been called the first Christian concert in Europe. And it brought down the house. Paul lived what he later taught these Philippians, the Philippian church again, about rejoicing in the Lord always. And that church had his example in their prison <laughs> to know that it can be done. The Lord heard Paul and Silas's prayers and their praises. And there was also someone else that was hearing it, prisoners. The other prisoners in that prison heard it too. Paul and Silas were ministering to these men. The word heard means that they listened to what they were hearing. They were taking note of what they were saying and what they were singing. And I am sure that they were baffled that they could have that type of response of faith toward God after enduring such brutal treatment. 
G. Campbell Morgan once wrote, any man can sing when the prison doors are open and he's set free. The Christian soul sings in prison. I think that Paul would probably have sung a solo had I been Silas. But I nevertheless see the glory and grandeur of the Holy Spirit that rises superior to all the things of difficulty and limitation. As the other prisoners were listening to their prayers and songs of praise to God, the ground suddenly started quaking and the prison started shaking and then the doors flew open and everyone's chains loosened and fell off. But it did not demolish the building. This was a supernatural strategic earthquake by the Lord to just open the doors and loosen the chains to free Paul and Silas and the other prisoners. The jailer was sound asleep. The earthquake woke him. But he wasn't neglecting his duty by being asleep. We know that there were other guards on duty by him later calling for a light from one of them. But when the jailer awoke and saw the prison wide open, he assumed that the prisoners had run and, and escaped. Earlier in Acts, we find that after Peter had been set free from prison by an angel, it states in Acts 12, 19, when Herod had sought for Peter and found him not, he examined the keepers of the prison, that is, and commanded that they be put to death. In Roman law, a guard who allowed his prisoner to escape was liable to the same penalty the prisoner would have suffered. Death was the certain fate of jailers if any of his prisoners escaped. He knew it, so he decided to take matters into his own hand. He drew his sword to commit suicide and to avoid the shame of a public execution. It's hard to tell for certain, but it seems that Paul likely heard him unsheathe his sword or he caught a glimpse or a shadow of what he was about to do and Paul cries out, no, stop, we're all here. All the prisoners were there, all present and accounted for, he tells them. How rare would it be today if in a prison all the cell doors suddenly swung open and nobody ran. And that's not likely to happen, but that's what happens here. They might have remained out of fear, but my personal belief is that they remained out of respect for Paul and Silas. Their response to their trial, Paul and Silas, Silas's response, so moved them that after they were loosed, they did what Paul and Silas did, and so they stayed put. Acts 16, 29 to 31 reads, Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The jailer called for a light, for a torch to be given to him by one of the guards. Holding the torch, he jumps into the prison. The prison had been trembling. Now the jailer was trembling. Finding them still there, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Emotion sweeps over the jailer. He doesn't speak until he brings them out of the prison. You have to remember at this moment, he's thinking about life, death, and eternity. His brush with death and near suicide, coupled with the earthquake, the fact that the prisoners had not escaped, Paul's reassuring words that saved his life, all come together to move him to ask for the way of salvation. He knew that they knew the answer to that question and that they had something he needed, what must I do to be saved, is the single most important question any person could ever ask, and it is the one that all need to ask before you die. And the answer to that question is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Just believe. It's by faith alone. 
It's by faith in Christ alone, and you will be saved. The Philippian jailer asked, what must I do? Paul's answer was that he didn't need to do anything to be saved. He just needed to believe. And it's just by believing on Christ, trusting Him as your personal Savior, is how we are saved from our sins and saved from hell. We only need to believe because God has done everything necessary for our salvation in His Son and by His death and resurrection. The words, in thy house, mean simply, this goes for your household too. They, as well as you, are saved just by believing on Christ and trusting Him alone to save you. And the Philippian jailer believed on Christ, and he was gloriously saved from his sins. Paul saved the Philippian jailer from physical death by calling out to him before he killed himself, and then he led him to a saving knowledge of Christ, and he was saved from eternal death through Christ alone. But notice that the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? That's where each person needs to ask that question in the Word of God. It's by asking Paul, because the answer is found in his letters. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven revealed the saving gospel to him for this age of grace. Salvation by grace through faith alone is only found in the epistles of Paul. And that gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it does the things that we see in this account. It shakes the foundations of a life. It sets the prisoner free. It gives light, the light of life and truth in Christ, and it saves from eternal death. The Philippian jailer is a portrait of grace because he was saved by grace and grace alone by faith in Christ. And we are saved the exact same way as He, by grace, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting Him as our personal Savior. Have you believed? Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.